Very honoured to be joined by Matthew Olford from the University of Bath, who is an expert on all things to do with Hollywood and the relationship with the Pentagon and the CIA. This is going to be fascinating. I think you're going to enjoy this, everyone. So, Matthew, let's start with this. Let's start with this. I mean, a lot of people just hear this and think, oh, tinfoil hats at the ready. Uh, you know, secret conspiracies, the US government and, 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 and Hollywood and propaganda. This is all just conspiratorial gibberish. What would you say to that? Uh, well, that's exactly what I thought for ages, uh, for many years at the start of, uh, I, I mean, I've been studying the relationship between Hollywood and politics for about, say, 15 years or so. Um, and at the beginning, uh, my attitude was, you know, that there is a confluence between, ideologically, between what Hollywood uh, produces uh, and the kind of dominant ideologies, the kind of warfare um, uh, uh, war, uh, warfare messages of the American state, but that there's no particular link, that there's no deliberate CIA and military manipulation of, uh, of Hollywood film scripts. I mean, we knew it happened a little bit on the fringes, maybe with a couple of hundred films or so over the previous century. Um, but yeah, it was a kind of tinfoil hat. It's the kind of thing, you know, you can imagine like uh, if you're, if you're a stoner and you're kind of saying, well, the TV controls everything, man. I think that the military controls the TV. And then when we actually looked into it in real detail and acquired documentation, um, we found actually that's really not far off what is genuinely the case. That doesn't mean that the military and CIA control every program, and it, um, and it doesn't mean that they even control every single depiction of the military or the CIA, but they do control a, a, a big, big chunk of them. Um, and that has been going on for 100 years, but accelerating over the past 20 years um, uh, uh, with, uh, with really considerable results, you know, affecting a, a, a lot of our, uh, of, our, of our popular entertainment. So let's start with something called the Entertainment Liaison Officer Office, sorry, the Entertainment Liaison Office of the Pentagon, which was established in 1948. What are we talking about here? Well, basically, there, there was a uh, what seemed to be uh, and kind of was quite a tiny office of uh, just a few people um, at the Pentagon, the Department of Defense in Washington, D.C., um, which basically were there ostensibly to provide a bit of advice and support for um, for film productions starting from the late 40s. They'd done a little bit of it in sort of informally as well prior to that. Um, uh, and then that office has, through kind of mission creep, if you like, um, and as PR has developed as, a, uh, as an idea, as the importance of marketing you know, everything from toothpaste to the latest war has become more important uh, to organizations, whether they're commercial organizations or political organizations, um, that office has become uh, bigger, bigger, I think, in terms of personnel, uh, although they're quite vague on, on, on the numbers of people that actually work through them anyway, uh, but certainly much bigger in terms of the effect that they are willing and able to have on film and television productions. So you obtained, largely through the US Freedom of Information Act, uh, files which show that between 1911, we're going back a long, long way here, and 2017, more than 800 feature films received support from the US government's Department of Defense. That's actually a lot higher than, as you, you've noted, uh, than previous estimates indicate. Now, these include, now it's over a long period, that's over a century, but they include little fa family favourites, Transformers, Iron Man, The Terminator. I love The Terminator. I'll be back. So tell... tell Not tell The Terminator 1. Uh, oh, you know, Termin the Terminator 1 was a really good film uh, and was in creatively independent. Terminator 2. Stay here. I'll be back. Creatively independent, really good film. It's only when the military started to get involved that the series went absolutely down the swanny. They had a bit of influence over Terminator 3, although not much, and I still quite like that film. But by the time they got to Terminator Salvation, there was full cooperation. 
and um, that was Terminator 4. I'm glad um, Terminator T is fine because that is one of my favourite films. Of oh, all yeah, time. don't worry. Terminator 2 was untouched. You don't have to reevaluate your view of Terminator 2, uh, which I you know, is one of my favourite films as well. Uh, but what was done to that franchise was an absolute travesty. Uh, and it was largely because of the military itself being involved. And that's why you have these kind of crazy kind of war on terror messages through that fourth film. Um, uh, and these kind of moral choices about the, the military will always be there to protect us. And all that is it's constantly uh, as a refrain throughout the movie. And then particularly as uh, at the end when they kind of ride off into the sunset mm -hmm. in this kind of nuclear wasteland as a kind of happy ending because of the army. It, 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 that's that, but that's a kind of standard thing that's happened. I mean, Terminator is one that annoys me because I wanted that to stay good, um, but th that's a standard thing that happens. Um, yeah, I thought Terminator Three was questionable myself, but in terms yeah, of these, really. in terms of these films uh, like Transformers and Iron Man, as UGs, which are often very celebrated, what's happening? I mean, what what are we talking about? Because some people go, oh, okay, they got some support from. The US government's Department of Defense could be a bit dodgy, but these are just great films. Chill out, you big lefty killjoy stamping over our film can sa can sang castles. What's the problem? <laughs> uh, well, it, I mean, it wouldn't be a problem if it was just some fairly neutral, basic advice. Uh, that that would be something very different. I haven't got a particular problem with you know, so, you know, the military exists. If it advises people on stuff, you know, which way the, the medals go around or, you know, how to wear a hat or something, you know, that's fine. But but they're actually extremely invasive in these in, in these scripts. Um, I would say that the best way to describe it is to, is that the military acts um, very quietly or even secretly, really, uh, as a, a very invasive uh, additional producer. And it does so, uh, as you say, we had a list of 800 and something films from 80, uh, from 1911 to 2017. But actually that number, bear in mind, has really accelerated uh, post 9-11. Um, and the number of TV shows has exploded. Um, so every any TV show that ever shows any, even game shows and cookery shows and things like that, anything that's got anything to do with the military uh, there, that the military is heavily involved in, in the way that they are depicted. Um, yeah. and, and that's what makes it a much more, uh, you know, if it happened once, I mean, who cares? But it, it happens thousands of times. Um, I mean, the latest estimate that we had uh, is, is that there are probably over 10,000 scripts, entertainment scripts that have actually been impacted um, over the past, uh, well, over the past century. Um, but the vast majority of them being post-World War II. In fact, the vast majority of them being uh, 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 in the contemporary era. I think Flight 93 is a, quite a striking example because actually on its own merits, by the way, I thought it was quite a gripping um, film, but there is a narrative there and it isn't to slight the heroism of the passengers on that flight, which was obviously should be noted historically uh, to point out that there was, you know, it ends, does it not, with, I think it's a line, you know, this, the war and terror begins here or something. Mm. So along the line... Yeah, the same line that ends Terminator 4. <laughs> I, I didn't actually, I didn't realise that. Glad I didn't watch Terminator 4. That would ruin the Terminator series for me. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. Uh, that, I just won't do it. Um, yeah, Fly Night I mean, you know, which in that sense is, is, is a very political act because it's equating an act of courageous and a courageous attempt at survival by passengers who faced death and who prevented, this is why it's so courageous, far more people dying because the flight was going to be used as a weapon to kill many more civilians, and actions which murdered or killed huge numbers of civilians from Iraq, Afghanistan to other countries, Somalia, Yemen, we could go on. So, yeah, Flight 93, just give that as an example. I mean, I already did that. I was a bit loaded. But Flight 93, I think, is quite striking because it was gripping, but it did make people think, join the dots. This acts of courage by passengers to save other people and they died in the act of doing so. But think about all the other things that the US military have done and they're kind of the same thing. 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, th there was there were a couple of films with very similar titles and very similar things. One was called Flight 93. Another one, yes, we, we just saw another plane apparently go into the... Uh... Hitting the South Tower. This, this is incredible. A huge okay. one. Another one, and the, there was one by a British director, uh, Paul Greengrass, called United 93. That's the one I'm uh, thinking of. With, yeah, this is, but yes, it's similar things going on with them. Um, and yeah, I mean, sometimes taken in, in isolation, the, uh, I, I wouldn't want to be too heavily critical. I mean, I have been quite critical of United 93, but, you know, I don't really want to attack Paul Greengrass for doing a film about 9-11. I mean, it was a perfectly good film. It was based on the official record. Um, yeah, but it did inadvertently um, and with a considerable amount of support from the military and uh, and adhering as uh, extremely closely to the 9-11 uh, commission report, uh, it basically presented a very, a, a completely official history and then dramatized at the end with a kind of, you know, punch the terrorist to death kind of uh, literary flourish uh, that allowed it to be, um, it's one of those, it's one of those gray areas because it, it basically was a piece of propaganda, if you like. Um, but I, I don't know if Greengrass quite meant it like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it did, it was something that was meant to be kind of rabble rousing in a way, wasn't it? I mean, you, you write in, in a piece you, you wrote um, about this uh, not that long ago, a few years ago, when we include individual episodes for long running shows like 24 Homeland and NCIS, as well as the influence of other major organizations like the FBI and White House, we can establish unequivocally for the first time that the national security state has supported thousands of hours of entertainment. And I have to say Homeland in particular there, I think has been criticized for some of its portrayals, again, lots of people and people. Some of my best friends are Homeland fans. I literally was yeah, I mean, it's still a great series. No, no knocking it, but you know, for the first couple of years that that uh, series was out, you know, there was no discussion of there being CIA or Homeland um, uh, or Homeland support for uh, behind the scenes. Uh, but then it, it became apparent. You know, it was just it was us really putting in a ton of Freedom of Information Act requests, particularly my colleague Tom Secker, who's become known as a uh, in the British state as a vexatious requester because they're annoyed at him for putting in so many Freedom of Information Act requests that they think he's doing it just to annoy them, which I think he probably is partly. So, <laughs> good, la good lad, good lad. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but basically, that you know, all, all of that information comes from Freedom of Information Act requests, but is is not necessarily known at the time. The same thing with 24, the TV series, Jack Bauer TV series. You know, it wasn't known that that was, um, uh, that, that, that was, uh, uh, you know, kind of CIA initiative uh, you know, through talking points through, with the CIA and uh, having members of the cast go along to CIA headquarters and all that kind of thing for, for a long time uh, uh, until the series was, uh, you know, many years in. But a lot of those TV series all, all have that kind of support. Same with Jack Ryan, you know, the, there was one that was uh, the Jack Ryan series uh, uh, came out um, about Venezuela, for example, you know, loads of military support. But all the Marvel TV, uh, all the Marvel film, most of the Marvel films, um, and, and a lot of these TV series do uh, do have support, and with varying levels of um, uh, of changes that are uh, inflicted upon the scripts. If you I mean if you look at something like NCIS, um, which is kind of more trashy TV, I suppose, but you know that's got the kind of influence that you would expect from you know, like FBI head J, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, you know, literally like every script is poured over, every episode, you know, they are dictating um, whole plot lines, whole character arcs, um, everything is sanitized for the, the specific image of what they want to push out. Uh, and with, um, you know, so things like um, sexual assault in the military or racism in the military, all those storylines are just really awkwardly uh, uh, kind of grinded into these uh, in, in, into these programs so that they can be, be pumped out. S some other programs aren't quite as much, uh, are, are slightly more light touch, Homeland probably being one of them, although we, we don't have the full script on Homeland. But what we're, what we're seeing essentially is that these are not simply forms of entertainment. These are partly propaganda on behalf and by the national security state in order... Yeah to build consent, acquiescence, support actively for the aims of the national security state. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's, it's really clear. And that is, it does sound like a conspiracy, but um, yeah, it's, it's one that is, is completely accurate. Um, 
some conspiracies are true. It's just, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. the CIA is quite interesting because actually, as you write about, they, they in the 40s and 50s, tried to just prevent people talking about them. They weren't trying to get positive impressions. They were just like, don't just ignore us. We're not here. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And actually, they actually, as you know, suffered an erosion of public support. And they were often cast as the villain in th films like Three Days of the of the Condor and the Parallax, a Parallax View in the 70s and into the 80s. But they belatedly established an entertainment laser and obviously in 1996. Yeah. And I'm really glad, because this is a real bet noir of mine, because as you know, they made up for lost time, most emphatically on the Al Pacino film, The Recruit, but more, and this is my bet noir, the Osama Bin Laden assassination movie, Zero Dark Thirty, which I watched at the time and thought, look, okay, look, again, people are like, oh, you killed Joy. It's a technically very well done film. It's great. Yeah. But it is just unbelievably written with the ex obvious, clear aims of basically going, yeah, bad things happened. But look at the context. War's terrible. We have to do terrible things because of the terrible world in which we live. That was basically it, wasn't it? Yeah, so we did things you don't like. Oh, do you want to die in terrorism? I mean, that was what it was doing, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, but loads of films are doing that all the time. You know, it's a very standard narrative. You know, war is hell. What are you going to do? So it's sort of the Team America world police uh, narrative or, or kind of uh, ideology underlying it. Yeah, I mean, Zero Dark Thirty was, uh, again, heavily influenced. That was a slightly odd one, actually, because they they didn't go to the uh, entertainment liaison office primarily. They went right to the heads of some of the major agencies mm. to get support. Um, so it was a kind of, they didn't go through the usual process. Um, and that was partly, I think, because the CIA was um, uh, so keen to, to support them that they sort of went right, right to the top. Um, and that's why the, a lot of that documentation came out um, because I think it was, uh, uh, it was one of the. Um, so it was. It was actually quite a right wing because they wanted to. There was a right wing organisation that that acquired that information about Zero Dark Thirty, the behind the scenes, because they wanted to use it to attack the Obama White House. Um, but it, you know, it kind of revealed to us not just that the Obama White House was doing something wrong, but that you know the whole the whole film industry and the whole uh, defence establishment was doing something wrong, namely, basically again, co-producing a film. Um, and in this case, co-producing a film that was absolutely central to the narrative of the war on terror. And what's so fascinating about it is, as experts such as Alex von Tunzelman, who's a historian and screenwriter, wrote about, the torture scenes in Zero Dark Thirty are actually not just controversially, but controversially, but historically dubious, because the image presented by that film is that torture... You might not like it, guys, but do you want Osama bin Laden, Laden caught or not? And this, these terrible yeah. things we had to do were necessary in order for that to happen, when actually that is strongly pushed back against. And um, actually, the argument is that actually torture did not help catch Osama bin Laden. And there's lots of studies that show torture not forget about the wrongs of torture, but actually it's counterproductive because what often happens is people will say literally anything however groundless in order to stop being tortured so actually that yeah. film is an example of making people think to themselves well i'm hearing all these these bloody bleeding heart liberals going on about torture but you know in the in the real world you've got to get your hands dirty actually even on its own terms it doesn't work so actually that film presents something that's not true yeah completely i completely agree um, there's a film uh, with samuel l jackson called unthinkable um, which I wrote a piece about, which, where Samuel L. Jackson plays a character who uh, is a kind of uh, masochist who kind of wants to be tortured, but he's set bombs all around uh, new, uh, all around America, <laughs> nuclear bombs. It's this crazy kind of film that wasn't supported. But no, it actually had a bit of FBI support behind the scenes, funnily enough, because they wanted to water down the uh, the FBI characters so that they weren't involved in the torture. Um, it was just. Um, Sorry, Samuel L. Jackson was the torturer who had to extract from uh, uh, Michael Sheen um, the information to acquire the to find the bombs. Um, and so, yeah, that, that idea that um, that torture can work uh, is really firmly rooted in 
I guess it's firmly rooted in our society and maybe in human beings generally and within our uh, entertainment culture. And it is false. I, I agree with you. There are loads of cases where um, where where it leads to very misleading information um, and just on its own terms, it is not a, an effective way to acquire, you know, the, the most effective way, generally speaking, obviously there are exceptions, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, a lot of it is just about communicating, sitting down with a cup of tea with terrorists and just letting them talk um, tends to be the most efficient way. Uh, but in, in terms of Zero Dark Thirty, there are other little aspects that, so for example, they, 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 they sanitize some, even though those torture scenes seem um, really intense. Actually, they remove dogs, for example, um, and other uh, and other threatening things that were in those scenes, deliberately removed by the uh, at the request of the Department of Defense, um, so that they uh, so that the torture scenes kind of still seem well. It's kind of acceptable. I would probably do that. I, I'd shout at a terrorist if if I thought that it could do some something. But, yeah, I mean, yeah. That's, it's the worst of all worlds, then, isn't it? Because what they do is, yeah, they is. keep just enough unpleasant treatment for yes. to go to to think to themselves. Well, they are doing unpleasant things, but they have to. But yeah. also, they dilute how unpleasant it actually is, and so people go. And anyway, not that bad, especially given what they're against. Yeah, yeah. So, so in the in the film Unthinkable, which is a much smaller smaller film, but nevertheless an interesting one. That was the only change, as far as I'm aware, that the FBI insisted on, which was basically that all of these, um, uh, all of the official FBI torturers who would have tortured this guy, um, who's got the nuclear bomb secrets but loves it because he's a masochist, is is is, set, is like um, the thing that they that they watered down was that they were involved. So they all distanced themselves from Samuel L. Jackson, the torturer. Um, and they're like, oh, no, we can't possibly do this. No, that would be wrong. So it gives the impression that systems, that these national security organizations are basically like a bit lily-livered, really, and you need your Samuel L. Jackson there. You need him on the line, <laughs> etc. I mean, I like some, some of it which, which you've written about. It's just, it's just as you write, it's, petty. it's actually very petty. Like, yeah, there's a lot of petty Hulk. changes. Yeah, tell, tell me about Hulk, because I just think this is... In a Hulk, they they had pretty radical script alterations, um, including disassociating the military from the Greece and laboratories that created a monster and changing the code name of the operation to capture the Hulk from Ranch Hand to Angry Man because Ranch Hand had been the name of a real chemical warfare program during the Vietnam War. Why are they like that is petty. That is why it's, bother with that one? But it's just constant, just any any kind of association with anything negative, and uh, 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 almost the entirety of the Vietnam War is a is a uh, is a bad association for the American military. So you know that they, they you know they had a real pesticide a defoliation program called Operation Ranch Hand. It was in the original. Then, by coincidence, it was in the original script for Hulk, um, and the Department of Defense asked for it to be removed because they just don't want to remind anyone uh, anyone of that. But it's the same with them. Um, it, when they actually wrote that letter to the producers of uh, of Hulk, they uh, they didn't actually quite use the word sorry because they're careful about the way that they they phrase things um, because they don't, they know that things can can at some point can come out, but they nevertheless in an extremely pol an apologetic tone they 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 say look we've we've asked for so many changes here. And we are kind of sorry about that, but we've got to. There's no, um, so it's just the whole thing. That I've got a note here, actually. Um, uh, they removed all dialogue to all those boys, guinea pigs, dying from radiation and germ warfare. You know, just anything that sounds harsh, everything is watered down. They just get rid of it. Uh, they're ver very effective at it. I was pretty gutted about contact. So actually, again, again, I mean, I don't, I think it's oh, fine. Yeah, it's a great film. It is a great film. It is a great film. And, uh, Jodie Foster is always great in anything she did, but um, but as you as you've noted, they uh, the Pentagon negotiated the civilianization of almost all military parts, uh, including removing a scene in the original script where the military worries that worries that an alien civilization will destroy us with a doomsday machine, and because and this just shows just how far they go to just systematically cleanse any narrative whatsoever which in any way might make people question the security state in America, because that view was dismissed by Jodie Forrest's character as paranoia right out of the Cold War. Yeah. Now you can imagine 
instantly those people go, how dare you? Cold War. We were up against this terrible enemy and we did everything right. And how dare you suggest that was anything paranoid about everything we did, including, I don't know, overthrowing elected governments in Latin America. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just just constant, like all those things. It's not a surprise to me anymore when <laughs> these changes are, are revealed. Um, uh, anything to do with um, war crimes, anything to do with military suicide, anything to do with sexual assault, anything to do with mental illness in the military, anything to do with racism, including historical racism of any kind, even if it goes back to the 40s, um, anything to do with nuclear war, anything to do, any indication that that um, there may be that nuclear war will be harmful, uh, or that nuclear weapons might not be very secure. Um, all of these things are called officially uh, the, the Department of Defense calls them showstoppers, and that basically means we will not cooperate uh, with a production if they include any of these sort of things, unless we have complete control over how to present them. And, and so as I said, with the sexual assault thing on uh, on NCIS, um, but the similar uh, things on other series like Pensacola, and uh, uh, they they will actually control the storyline to, ex to the extent that they will raise the issue, but then completely dictate um, uh, the way that it's presented. Another thing, on, I'd say on Godzilla, that's really quite an interesting one about nuclear weapons. Um, you know, like Godzilla was originally designed as a kind of critique or a warning about science out of control, the use of nuclear weapons on uh, on Japan um, by the Americans in 1945. But actually, th that narrative has changed. Uh, and so the most recent um, Godzilla film, uh, well, it's gra changed gradually mm. um, so that it becomes less and less a critique of, of Americans in all the different iterations of Godzilla. And then the most recent one, they literally use nuclear weapons to power Godzilla. Yeah, yeah. The Americans use nuclear weapons to power Godzilla. At, and this is DOD controlled script so that they so that Godzilla can fight for them to to win to save the day. But I have to say the ironies I've... are just uh, abundant throughout throughout uh, throughout Hollywood. You know, this this whole uh, you know, I wouldn't have carried on researching this if it didn't throw up these kind of shocking, yeah. graceful examples on such a regular basis. I'd have given up about five years ago, but the material that came through was just absolutely crazy. I mean, I, I did say, I, th I, I had to say, I think the, the, the last Godzilla film, I, I, I mean, I, I thought it was pretty tedious, but I know lots of people enjoyed <laughs> it. But the reason it's so serious, I mean, let's just unpack just why this is so serious, because what it does is it, it, it presents to the American people who already often, you know, much of the media in the United States echoes this narrative anyway, um, which is how you end up with calamities like Iraq, which is the US is whoever's in charge is always driven by righteous reasons, not naked self-interest, but actually is often from a position of sacrifice taking on evil. And that's why mm -hmm. it behaves in the way it does. That sometimes it may do things which are unpleasant, but it's doing it for a good end. That is noble. And all the people in charge are noble, yep. decent, well-intentioned people. And that helps build acquiescence and support. So we end up from disaster, like the Vietnam War went up to 3 million civilians were killed, uh, as well as the carpet bombing of Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, the likes of Henry Kissinger obviously just walks free and, and all the rest of it and is celebrated in public life. To the Iraq war, we've seen the rehabilitation of George W. Bush because uh, somehow in contrast to Donald Trump, he doesn't tweet offensive things, but he did kill huge numbers of people. But that's not as serious as as being vulgar in public life. And and then you get, you know, the Afghan the, the, again, the defeat in Afghanistan. We've just done a video about what happened. Yeah, I saw that. Fascinating interview you did there. Yeah, and and then you get, you know, it's not just domestic consent, is it? It's cultural imperialism because partly this is and this entertainment industry is trying to persuade people in other countries where obviously Hollywood has global huge cultural reach and power that the US hegemon because it is the dominant power, it remains the dominant power despite a relative decline, partly because it keeps doing these wars, like going to war the war in Iraq, handed Iraq to Iran, essentially. So mm -hmm. even though they're destroying their own power, ironically, by these actual wars, they're, they're, they're trying to persuade the rest of the world through their films. We're doing this for the right reasons. 
We're a righteous uh, nation and our wars, our conflicts, we're doing it for you, for your own good. And the people who are fighting against this are just evil, evil people. And this is good versus evil. We're the goodies. They're the baddies. And that's, you know, whether it be, you know, independent, I don't know if Independence Day, it doesn't matter often because Independence Day was, again, it's a great film. Watched it recently just for the memories. But even if, you know, that doesn't have, you know, because it, because the, the thing is, it's so culturally dominant in the United States, whether or not the Pentagon and Defense, uh, Department of Defense, CIA are even directly involved, you know, on the, you know, they've imbibed it, haven't they? Despite the fact Hollywood's portrayed as a den of leftiness, you know, despite its history, McCarthyism and all the rest of it, it does have political aims which have terrible human consequences because helps it helps unleash these disasters. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, um, it, I, I sort of describe it as being the mood music of uh, military intervention. Uh, I mean, we don't really know. Does does it matter that I am in isolation? I don't care. Do you know what I mean? I don't care that if one film has military support, it's neither. Hit, but it's the fact that it's so systematic. And over time, um, does that mean that that the culture has been uh, significant enough to tip decisions? Now, on a decision like Iraq, for example, in fact, not just Iraq in two thousand and three, but in, indeed Iraq in nineteen ninety one. Those decisions were on a knife edge. A lot of it came down to public opinion. Now, if it weren't for this culture that we are creating that is top down, effectively produced in large part by um, PR officials in the Department of Defense and these other national security organizations, would that tip the balance? My guess is it probably would, that those people really are very important. Like the, the, the head of the ELO, the um, uh, Entertainment Liaison Office in um in the Pentagon said that he's like, uh, he said, this job is like being a minor eunuch in the court of Imperial China. That's just wow. so false. It's such a grandiose way to describe a complete falsehood. He's not a minor eunuch in the court of Imperial mm. China. Hollywood may well be Imperial China, but he was not a minor eunuch. They're a major player. And it's clear that that's just like a complete inversion of the truth. Um, so I do think that they that, that culture um, probably has a very decisive impact. Um, uh, you know, when there are knife edge decisions that are dependent on the public. You know, and, and, I, and, and I suppose finally, actually, what comes to mind to me as well is the so-called drone war, because what the drone war uh, has done is allow the US to shift its military operations from putting its own soldiers in the firing line. And that is historically what has most been likely to undermine public yeah. acquiescence when they see that yeah, our own boys are dying in large numbers, whilst basically turning war into a computer game where the people who are killed, whether they be three-year-olds in Pakistan, um, they're, they're, no one sees them. They're not given yeah. any agency. They're not given a voice. So people just think basically, based on these films partly, well, the US is just you know basically playing a computer game um, killing the baddies and we know this because these films show what a righteous uh, yeah again that's a, that's a, a major thing that's happened over the past 20 30 years you know the the, the uh, virtual or virtuous war as some of the kind of more establishment friendly uh, commentators uh, 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 termed it um, and of course that's the conflation of of uh, of, of politics and and entertainment um, and it's it's horrible it's really disturbing um, but it's very easy to, to, to turn a blind eye to, yeah. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. That was genuinely absolutely fascinating, and I hope it will make people think more carefully, not just about the role of films and all the rest of it, but how the war machine across the West sustains, you know, manufactures consent, uh, consent to borrow the terminology of Noam Chomsky, who we have previously interviewed, of course, on the show. Mm. We've we will include a link to an article that Matthew wrote for the conversation. Um, uh, whether this be you're watching this on video or listening to it on podcast, so just go to the description or below where you're watching and you can read it yourself. But thank you, Matthew, so, so much. It's genuinely absolutely fascinating stuff. Okay, my pleasure. Good to see you guys. Please support this channel for independent thought discussion of the most important issues that we face.